All right, come on in, come on in. Come on in. Shalom, shalom. Come on in, Shebrews. Come on in. Shalom, Sister Didi. Shalom, the water. The water. Let us get this tea party started. Come on in. As you come on in, please do me a favor. Hit the like button, share, and subscribe if you haven't already done so. Let's get this tea party started. Come on in. We've got an incredible show an incredible show prepared today. And we're going to get started in just a couple of minutes. I'm going to give, give others a couple of minutes to get to come on in so we can get started because there's a lot to unpack in this show today. There's, there's a lot. So I don't want anyone to miss to miss what we're about to get into with this show. So I am hoping that others will come in promptly. We're going to get started in about five minutes. Let's give it about five minutes to get, um, to get others in and get this, this royal tea party started. Come on in. So as you come in, tell me what's your cup of tea? What's your cup of tea today? Let's go ahead and get started. The water, Sister Dee Dee. I appreciate you texting others to come in, but we're going to get started pretty soon. We're, we're going to go ahead and get this tea party started because like I said, there's just so much to, to delve into tonight with this topic. And it's such a, an important, such a timely topic that um, I really hope that others will come in and not miss this broadcast tonight. 
I really do want to get others' um, opinions on this topic. So let's get others to come on in and let's get this conversation started. I really want to, you know, hear other people's um, feedback about this topic that we're about to delve into tonight. So let's go ahead. Let's get this tea party started. Shalom. So before I go any further, I'm going to go ahead and get started um, by first giving a huge praise to the Almighty Ahaya Bahashim Yeshaya Warawak Kadash for blessing us with this opportunity to come together again today. For those that don't know who Ahaya Bahashim Yeshaya Warawak is when we make when, when we claim those names, Ahaya is the name of the Most High God, I Am. Bahashim Yeshaya Warawak Kadash, that's his son, Yeshaya or Jesus, as the world knows him, and Warawak Kadash, the Holy Spirit. So we give all honor, praise, and glory to our God tonight for this broadcast and for bringing us together, bringing us through another week into a brand new week. And so we give him all the praise, honor, and glory. We also would like to give double honors to our elders, bishops, deacons, our officers that sacrifice their time and energy into spreading this tr tr truth, excuse me, throughout the four corners of the earth. I am your hostess, Akwa. And I humbly thank you for joining me in this broadcast today. Sister Didi, you said you're drinking country peach passion herbal tea. Wow, that sounds yummy. That, wow. I am having tonight, I am having one of my favorite teas and I'm just going to take a quick sip. And this is sorrel or hibiscus tea. And this tea is packed with antioxidants, which as we well know, is what we need to fight off viruses and um, infections and so on. So this is the perfect time of year to have this hibiscus tea. It's, it's just a, an overall very healthy tea and it's sweetened with honey and it is just it is just such a pleasant taste and it's also it has a lot of spices in here i pack spices in my tea um you know a lot of cinnamon and um cardamom and i i, I put a lot of spices in my tea and um, it just brings out such a great flavor in the teas. Once again, before moving too far into the discussion, I also need to make some disclaimers about what this channel is not. Let me start by saying tea time with Shibu royalty is not going to be everybody's cup of tea. And that's okay. If you happen upon this channel accidentally and you realize that you do not agree with our beliefs and our lifestyle, it's okay to keep searching YouTube until you find your perfect cup of tea. You owe that to yourself. And I'm sure that you will find your perfect flavor if you continue to search. Please do not leave any insults or derogatory statements in the comments if you realize that this channel is not your cup of tea. That would be distasteful. We would really appreciate it and we thank you in advance. For those of you that happen to um, come upon this channel 
and you are not sure if this is your cup of tea, we welcome you to stay and listen and learn. And who knows, you may acquire a taste for what tea time with Hebrew royalty has to offer. So we welcome you. Also, although we will be touching on topics of health and wellness in some of our broadcasts, we will not be using this platform to diagnose or treat anyone's illnesses. If you are experiencing any medical problems, please consult your healthcare practitioner. This channel is also, you will hear the views of myself, my co-host, and even the guests. These views are to be recognized as our personal views and not that as of any particular church or organization. So without further ado, if you haven't already done so, please share, like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell, and let's get this tea party started. Shalom, Sister Jeanette. So good to see you. So good to see you. Welcome. Welcome. Let's get started. Also, in, later on in, in, in the broadcast, I'll be opening up the video for calls, to, for you to call in with your questions, comments, and it's not a phone line, it's a video line, so I am encouraging you sisters to get yourself video ready and to come on, to come on to the video and share your experiences ask your questions, give your comments so that we can get this conversation on, you know, off to a really great start. I really want to hear what others out there have to say about the specific topic that we're going into tonight. Also, Tea Time with Sheba Royalty is a new channel and we are trying to expand and grow so that we can do our part in helping to heal our nation. That being said, I am looking for sponsors, guests, business owners, entrepreneurs that would like to collaborate with us so that we can help each other to help our nation, Yasharala. If you are ready to answer the call, please email me at shebrewroyaltybiz at gmail.com. I'm going to put that up on the screen so that you can have my email address. Let me get that. Let me get that up on the screen really quick for you. There it is. Shebrew Royalty Biz at gmail.com. Right. Wow, so I am ready to get this conversation started. And as others come in, um, we may do a brief overview of what we've discussed thus far. But I really want to go ahead and get, get this conversation started about the topic tonight. And this is a very, very important topic that um, I think it's this is the perfect time for us to, to really discuss this particular topic. And like I mentioned last, a couple of weeks ago, um, that tonight's topic was going to be basically reviewing a book. And this book, Medical Apartheid, The Dark History of Medical Experimentation on Black Americans from Colonial Times to the Present. This book was written by Harriet A. Washington. 
and this is this is what we're going to be discussing tonight we're going to just review a little bit about this book and its contents and the information that's in it and i want to hear your opinion and hopefully there are some of you out there that have had the opportunity to read the book or to even listen to it on the in its audio form this book it was stunningly and masterfully written by like i said before harriet a washington she's an author and medical ethicist it shares it shares sheds light on the atrocious medical experiments performed on quote unquote black americans whom we know to be hebrew israelites from slavery to present this book is very eye-opening and it's quite thought-provoking and in my opinion it is a must read for every american whether you be israelite or gentile and definitely every medical provider so who has read or listened to this book on audio wow so sister Jeanette said let me go ahead and pull your comment up here sister Jeanette said I did listen to it sister I, it was very eye-opening, but also made me kind of mad. I get it. <laughs> I I get it. Yes, and that's some of that's some of what we want to talk about is what were your feelings, what were your thoughts when you were listening to or reading this book? What was going through your head? Um, because for myself. Yeah, it I it brought up so many emotions for me. It it brought up quite a bit of emotions for me and and like you, sister Jeanette, it made me mad. It really it really did. It made me it made me angry. Um but I want to get into that. So I purchased this book on Amazon. I normally go on Amazon and I'm always on there purchasing books, especially books that are recommended by our elders. But this book, I just happened upon it when I was on Amazon shopping for something else. And this book just popped up on my homepage based on my previous purchases and searches, Amazon recommended this book. And this was back in 2020 during the campaign that we know was going on back in, back in 2020. And when it popped up and I read the title, because I had never heard of this book before, 2020. But I was intrigued. I was intrigued by the name due to the fact that I was and I still am to some extent a medical provider. But I was a medical provider um, practicing at that time. And we were in the middle of what we all knew to be or considered to be a medical experiment on the entire world's population. So I immediately purchased the book. And when I when I received it and started to read through it, I was not shocked, nor was I in disbelief. What I was was horrified at the contents of this book, what I was reading. And for most of you out there, like myself, I we've heard of the Tuskegee experiment and vaccine trials. But I must admit, I was ashamed that I was not aware 
of the magnitude of the atrocities that were inflicted on our people at the hands of so-called medical doctors. I was not aware of all of the information that's in this book. So imagine being a medical provider and reading through this book and realizing the atrocities that were done on, on your people, on people as a whole. But especially, this book is about, quote unquote, Black Americans from colonial times to the present. And so that's what we want to focus on, the people that this book is referencing. Considering the overall mistreatment of slaves on every level, it should not be shocking that the mistreatment also reared its ugly head, its wickedness in medicine as well. Also, having been a medical provider for so many years and seeing what I've seen during my career, I, knew, I know and I knew that the, experiment, the experimentation has not stopped. For instance, there's push for gender affirming hormone therapy and gender reassignment surgeries in teens. And now there's an even bigger push to start these hormone therapy in even younger children than, teen, than teenagers. So we know that that in itself is speaking to experimentation that's being done currently. So what I did next after I, re after I purchased this book, although I had not finished reading the entire book at that time, I was so moved, I was so moved by the little that I had read and I just, I had to express my disgust to the staff on my job where I was at the time when I, when I purchased this book. And the reason, the reason I had to do that is because, like I said, this was in, in the middle of, well, at the beginning stages of the campaign back in 2020. And this is when the jab was now being rolled out and it was being pushed on everyone. Although we knew that these jabs did not go through the, the trials as every other vaccine before them had gone through. And that raised a red flag for me, especially having, like I said, been a medical, pro pro medical provider for as long as I had been. Not only that, but there was this atmosphere now in the workplace where those who were not willing to submit to to the vaccines, it the workplace had become, in, in my opinion, and in my experience, a hostile work environment. Having to sit here and listen to others, talk about, talk down to, ridicule those who chose not to go along with, with the vaccine. For myself, it was no, it, it should not have been a shock to my employers. Why? Because I had been refusing um, 
and the flu vaccines and had been using my religious exemption before this came out. So actually, when the rollout happened, they already knew. And what they did was sent me my form to fill out for my exemption. And I did that. However, I would sit and listen to those around me. And when we had our Zoom meetings at the time, providers of, and, and I'm talking primarily at that time, mental health providers that were sitting in meetings and ridiculing, talking down about patients that were refusing to get the vaccine and talking about how can we get them to basically acquiesce. And after receiving this book, that made me even more angry. I had already at this stage placed, I had already turned in my resignation from my job. I had decided at this point that it was time for me to walk away from my current, my job at the time. And I had decided to start working, working from home. Before I did that, however, during a meeting, a, a Zoom meeting, I took this book with me to the meeting. And there was another book also that I took to my meeting with me. This, this is another book that at some point we will probably review as well. This book is Miller's Review critical vaccine studies. And this was written by Neil Z. Miller and the foreword by Gary Goldman, PhD. So these are reputable sources, right? But these are the two books that I took to my meeting. And like I said, we won't be reviewing this book today, but at some point, more than likely, this will be our next book review, The Most High Willing. But sticking with medical apartheid, the dark history of medical experimentation on Black Americans from colonial times to the present, this book, I took to, to the meeting and I listened to everyone at the meeting make their comments and once again, there was this atmosphere of ridicule and talking down about the name call in. We, I was sitting here listening to them talk about these anti-vaxxers. And like I said, at that, at that time, it was, it was basically okay for these terms, these labels, to be placed on people without knowing, first of all, the reason why these people were refusing the vaccine. It may have been, once again, religious reasons. It may have been medical reasons, but they were given a broad label of anti-vaxxers. And so I listened I listened to everyone on that panel. And normally at these meetings, I usually didn't give much input. Why? Because a lot of times it was just that. People talking about their political views, talking about, you know, the when when the elect when election time <laughs> When that was happening, they were, you know, talking down about the people who weren't voting the way that they were voting. So that was the atmosphere. 
and I had nothing to contribute to those conversations. However, this day, at the end of at the end of the meeting, before we closed out, I asked for a moment to speak. And I addressed everyone on that panel. And I explained to them that normally I come to these meetings and I usually have nothing to add. And I gave the reason why, and it was basically what I just said. And I said, but today is different. And the reason is because I have sat here and I have listened to each and every one of you talk down about our patients for making choices that they have a right to make for their own bodies. You've sat here and you've ridiculed them. You sat here and you've called them names. You've given them labels of anti-vaxxers without even knowing the reason why. And I explained to them that it was not their place to coerce. It was not their place to talk down about or ridicule people who make choices for themselves. They have a right to make a choice for their bodies. Just like you made a choice to do what you did, they made a choice to accept or deny what was offered to them. I said, your job is to inform and allow them the opportunity to either consent or not consent to the treatment that you are offering. I said, so while you were sitting there talking about them and the name calling that was going on and the labels that you were placing, realize that you were talking to me as well. And I said, so let me shed some light on the reason why a lot of your patients will not be acquiescing to get in the vaccine. And I said, many of them know. And I said, if you don't have this book, and I brought the books out, I brought both of the books out to them. And I presented both books to my, to my coworkers at that time. And I said, if you haven't already read this book, you need to read this book. And I gave them the name of the book and I told them what this book was about. I said, most people would like for you to believe that the Tuskegee experiment is the only experimentation that was done on black people in this country. I said, but look at this book. It's filled with atrocities. And I said, although these patients may not know in, in, in its entirety what I am now privy to in this book, they know that they have a right to deny. These, the, the people in this book did not have that right. But we are at a time right now where we have a right to make choices for our own bodies. And I said, your patients have that right and you have no right to take that from them. And needless to say, <laughs> they sat there dumbfounded. And that was my last week on that job. I am hoping I am hoping that some, if not all, of my ex-co-workers took heed to what I said, that they actually purchased the book and read why is it that so many of our people do not trust the healthcare system. 
and do not trust the government. And if you have read this book, you would see the seed that was planted and that's continued to be watered. So with that being said, let's, let's get into this book. I, I chose, uh, you know, I chose this topic for this week. I just felt like it was just perfect timing for us to review this book. And I really feel that this is, this is the perfect time. I listened to this book um, this past week. I actually listened to it in its entirety on YouTube audio, because like I said, back in 2020, I didn't finish reading the book. And this, past week, I decided to listen to it on the audio in audio form because it allowed me to um, do my housework while listening. It also allowed me to listen while I was in my car, while I was grocery shopping. Um, so I, I, I listened to it throughout the day. This, the, the, um, the audio is over 10 hours long. So it's, it's pretty lengthy, but when you listen to this, this book or when you're reading it, there's so many emotions for myself that, that I experienced. I felt myself feeling angry, sad, disgusted. And I spoke, I've spoken to some of you sisters since I listened to this book. And you also expressed, some of you also expressed the same emotions. So imagine how Harriet, <laughs> Harriet Washington, the ethicist, Imagine how she felt during the entire time that she was researching the facts that led to her writing this very poignant book. So as a matter of fact, let's not imagine how she felt. I'm going to show a video of an interview with her giving an account of what it was like for her to do the research and also to author this book. So let me let me um, get this video up and I want you to listen to what she has to say. My name is Harriet Washington. Um, I'm a writer, medical ethicist. I wrote a book entitled Medical Apartheid, which was the first comprehensive social history of um, research with African Americans. Um, and it dealt with not only history of medicine, but also with social ills, racism. And a lot of my work has also focused on the intersection of ethics, history, and race in this country as it pertains to medical practices. Uh, it's a special interest of mine. I um, also do some teaching. I teach a bioethics course at Columbia University and lecture widely in this country and abroad about medical ethics issues, everything from conspiracy theories um, to um, the erosion of informed consent. And I find uh, a great deal to keep me occupied. <laughs> I was very happy to be invited back to EVMS. I, I lecture at many medical schools and institutions across the country. Fair but use. This one always stayed in my mind. Fair I use. This is for educational purposes only. I find it a really exciting place because of the progress and the focus on um, issues of medicine and medical practice and medical care 
that go beyond uh, clini the clinical classwork and the clinical issues. Uh, the issues are embedded in our society and they dramatically affect how people's health um, waxes and wanes. And this is a school, an institution that has always taken this to heart, has always understood that one can't treat people in isolation in a clinic or in a hospital bed, that the entire person has to be addressed. And that means addressing um, some unfortunate aspects of our society. And um, anyway, it's always had a special place in my heart and I'm very happy to be back here. It's hard to know what first piqued my interest in looking at the history of ethics as it pertained to African-Americans and their treatment by the medical institutions in this country. But I know that um, my initial desire to be a physician and working in hospitals for over 10 years certainly sharpened that interest. I saw many things that troubled me and disturbed me, many questions I had about the interactions between individual patients and clinicians. And I actually found that clinicians were often very open about discussing with me their own trepidation about the way they um, felt constrained to treat patients. But it was um, a really interesting experience I had that I recount in medical apartheid when I was running a poison control center in a hospital in upstate New York. We were allowed to have extra space. It was ceded to us by radiology. and. I also found an old file cabinet that I knew I could use in my office. So I'm opening this file cabinet, cleaning it out, and I found all these old filed folders of patients that had been forgotten. And being who I am, I read every last one of them, of course. And I was struck by the fact that these were patients who were being considered for kidney transplantation. But their files looked different, and the differences seemed to be um, assorted according to race. The files of the black patients were very thin, and those of the white patients were fatter. It's because the ones of the white patients had reams and reams of documentation about their social history, positive, they had positive support from family and friends about their, um, their insurance that made them able to pay for this kind of procedure, and bolstering their claim you know, for a new kidney, the, called the social profile. The social profiles of the other patients, the black ones, everyone had the word Negro stamped on it. And they were, they were thinner. Although in particular, I saw one, one uh, file that were a gentleman who had insurance, had a loving family like the other patients. And yet the um, plan for this patient was not to help him find an organ, but to help him prepare for his imminent demise. And I thought, is it race that's separating these patients from a kidney that they need to live? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but it certainly looked suspicious and I had to know more. I, and um, I think that triggered my interest. I was After that, I began looking everywhere to see whether or not black and white patients were being treated equally with the same access to life uh, saving um, technologies. And just mainly often I saw that they were not. I wasn't a writer then, that's the interesting thing. I, I was running a poison control center, but um, when I became a writer, I knew it would be the first uh, book that I felt passionately about, and it was. After I had the opportunity to train in medical ethics, I spent uh, two and a half years training in medical ethics, and one of the questions I had was that um, there was one study and seemingly only one study that was acknowledged and well-known among many people in which African-Americans were mistreated. And that was a Tuskegee study. But I had already learned from my own curiosity, my own research, that there had been many, many studies, many of them, in fact, most of them, much worse than Tuskegee. Studies in which African-Americans were actively harmed, killed even. And I wondered why Tuskegee had such a you know, such root in the American psyche. And I quickly realized it's because that's all people know about. Very often I would ask people about research with African-Americans, clinical people, historians, people who should know. And they would only say Tuskegee. You're, talk you're asking about Tuskegee, right? I'm like, no, I'm asking about everything else. I realized people did not know this history at all. And I went to um, international conference in Lübeck, Germany of historians of medicine focused on me medical experimentation in the 20th century. And 
they all said that only Tuskegee had harmed African Americans. I knew that wasn't true. Um, so I began realizing the consequences of not understanding that there had been um, scores and scores of abusive medical research with African Americans over the decades. The consequences are that very often Tuskegee was dismissed as a terrible thing that happened, but it was accorded, the fears of African Americans to engage in medical research were accorded to Tuskegee. Well, they don't want to engage in medical research because they're overreacting to Tuskegee. It was called an overreaction to a single study, and I knew that wasn't true. I knew that people were actually reacting to centuries of abuse, and I thought it was really important to document that because nobody else had. When I went to the medical libraries in Europe and in the U.S., prestigious organizations like Harvard's Countway Library, you would find Fair shelves use filled with abuse for educational toward whites purposes and other groups, only. but nothing on the abuse of African Americans, nothing in books. But when I went to the basement and looked at the medical journals from the 18th, 19th century, I saw plenty there, but it was episodic. And I thought someone needs to pull this together so that people will understand that there's an entire canon of abusive research with African Americans. So people will stop dismissing it as a myth when these were actually all too real. And that's what I did. You know, it would have been good if I could have said the book ended with Tuskegee, that we had learned everything that we should have learned, but we didn't at all. So what's happened is that we have many, many abuses after Tuskegee, at least as many after Tuskegee as beforehand. And there is not a sphere of American medicine that has gone untouched. Radiation experiments, you know, um, experiments with children, reproductive um, ab abuse and experimentation. Um, it's everywhere. Any sphere in which there's an interaction of Af African Americans with the system, you're going to find their abuse by the system. And in research settings, it was even more prevalent because in research settings, unlike therapeutic set settings, um, there was a laissez-faire attitude often, often reigned. Um, the interesting thing is that today we comfort ourselves that we have this matrix of laws that protect research subjects. And we do. That's a good thing. But laws are only as good as the people who um, enforce them and adhere to them. And all too often the laws are not being adhered to. And even more often, we are passing laws now that actually erode informed consent, that reduce people's right to say yes or no in medical research. And when we do that, African Americans are often the most um, frequent victims of that. So unfortunately, although we do not engage in the most horrific physical abuses of the 18th and 19th centuries, we still do have many, many research studies that are ethically problematic and frankly abusive. So we still have not learned everything that we should have. The most valuable um, takeaway for students is to understand that they are the people with the least power and the most to lose by implicitly or explicitly criticizing the system, criticizing their professors, criticizing the way medicine is performed. And yet it's absolutely critical that they have the courage to speak up if they think they see something wrong. There are several reasons for that. One reason is that medical students have, in my opinion, a privileged perspective. They're still not completely socialized as doctors. So they still are able to see things from a lay person's point of view. And frankly, most doctors lose that eventually. It's part of the training. And it's nothing wrong with that. I mean, you're socialized into a profession and you gain, frankly, so much more. But as medical students, you still have both worlds. You know, you're training as a physician, you have that perspective, but you can still see things from a lay person's perspective. Sometimes only you can see that something is wrong. Sometimes only you can be sensitive enough to understand that something can be abusive. Um, and it's critically important to speak up, even though it's risky, even though it might cost you something, because you may be the only one seeing this wrong, and you may even be successful. You may even convince 
your attendings, your superiors, your colleagues, that they need to reevaluate a practice or reevaluate a stance. So in that way, you can, and students have been, extremely important in advancing ethical thinking in medicine. I'm thinking, for example, of a group of London students. When I was studying medical ethics, in London, there were a few students who were being asked to do, as students had been asked to do for decades before them, you're going to learn to do a pelvic examination by practicing on this unconscious woman. She's been prepped for another surgery. She's unconscious. Now's your chance. Learn how to do a pelvic. And some students said, no, I don't want to do this. She hasn't given her permission. She's not awake, which means if I should, I don't know what I'm doing. Should I hurt her? She can't even tell me. It's wrong. They convinced their attending. They convinced people in their hospital. That hospital stopped allowing this practice. Other hospitals fell, um, fell in suit. And in this country, some hospitals also no longer allow this. So their vision actually changed the practice of medicine. And that's the most important thing I have to say to medical students. I had hoped when I wrote this book that um, it would inspire other people especially historians of medicine, to write about some of the issues that I addressed. I hoped it had been my dream that this would actually be viewed as a new, I don't know, become a new canon in the history of medicine, um, that people would explore this history. And I've seen that happen. Uh, there's now been a book um, published on the, uh, I did a chapter on the fate of African-Americans immediately around the time of the Civil War. And there's been a book um, published on that very subject. I did a, a section of the book where I talked about the government's propensity for um, supporting psychiatrists who were looking into a connection between violence and race. And um, someone, Jonathan Metzl wrote a book, um, The Protest Psychosis, that deals exactly with that. So I'm seeing more and more. Very recently, the New York Times has started a brilliant new series, 1619, uh, to commemorate the 400 years since uh, Africans first set foot on the continent. And in this series, the first session of the series, I'm reading it, and I'm th I felt like I was reading my book. I mean, the story of John Brown, which I tell in my book, is there. The story about the vaccination by Onesimus. I mean, all these things I had written in my book 12 years earlier are now in the New York Times, you know, and everyone's reading them. And, I'm, and that's made me very happy. That's what I want to see. I want to see um, more and more people delve into this history and more importantly, what this history can tell us about what's going on today. How we can interpret events today in the light of our history to understand and hopefully not repeat the mechanisms that bring them to, to bear. Since I wrote Medical Apartheid, I've written several other books, and one of them had to do with the pharmaceutical industry and is, is commercialization of me medicine and medical research. But I've been focusing more lately on cognitive effects of medical, um, I don't know, injuries. Um, I wrote a book called Infectious Madness where I talked about pathogens and their role in mental disease. And a very recently published book um, is about environmental toxicity, environmental po racism, and its cognitive effects. I mean, we all know that lead causes brain damage. We all know that heavy metals like mercury and arsenic al also do that. But I write about the fact that pathogens, pesticides, even banned pesticides, and PCBs and industrial chemicals all take their toll on human minds. And environmental racism means that they're taking a greater toll on people of color than they are on whites. And all that means. So I started by talking about intelligence, IQ testing, what it really means, what it really tests. And then I go on to explain and document how exposure to all these um, you know, noxious chemicals and pathogens is affecting our intelligence, our collective intelligence, but is disproportionately um, victimizing African-Americans. So that's my, that's my current obsession.
All right. I am now going to bring in my beautiful, amazing co-hostess, Aquat Sierra, so she can join in this conversation. Shalom, Shalom, <laughs> Aquat, how are you? Shalom, beautiful. Shalom. How are you doing? I am doing amazing. How are you? I am great. As you can see, yeah, that the background thing worked. So I'm nice and clear. It's not spotty anymore, my video. And then if you can hear me fine, then my audio is awesome as well. I so that's hear great. you perfectly <laughs> fine. And we missed you last week. Oh, I know. We really I missed you guys. <laughs> yeah. I wanted we that video right. So yeah, I'm 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 so happy to be back and I missed you guys as well. You look beautiful. Kawada, <laughs> you as well. It is just so good to see your beautiful smiling face again. Oh my goodness. Kawada. We really did miss you. And I've had some of the sisters ask, is Sister Sierra going to be on? <laughs> of course she is. Of course she is. That is she awesome. Out, worked out the kinks. Worked out Praise the, the most high. The Praise the most high with the audio and video um, visuals and and here we are. So let us let us delve into this this book. My goodness. And what what emotions did did this evoke? Man, uh Aquath, it I mean I was sitting there at work listening to it and I'm just sitting there and I can feel, you know, when I get mad my pit starts sweating. <laughs> And I'm sitting there and I'm just like, I'm hot, you know, I'm getting hot. And I'm just like, this is, this is upsetting, you know, um, it's, it's so disturbing. And we've had, we've heard um, of this history, you know, before it's not anything new, um, but to, to hear it being, you know, gone through in detail, mm -hmm. um, the way that that sister is putting it out there is, um, by far, like I said, one some of the most disturbing things um, one could ever hear, any any race of women could ever want to hear, and um, it is it is uh, so sad that we've we've really we we're really out here <laughs> when the Bible speaks on you know the curses and us us the uh, Jacob's trouble. We're we're definitely we're, we've we've right. been through it. We're going through it. We 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 have been going through it, mm -hmm. and we continue to go through it. But to wow. be able to actually have the documentation mm. and how she meticulously she took the time to do the research in depth and. Uh, to put it in this book, to package it this way for us, because no one else thought about doing this. Mm. Why? Because for whatever reason, we are not looked at. We haven't been, and we still are not looked at as being as important as other people. You know, when when you sit back and you hear and, and I think what really pushed me to go into this topic even more so is because we continually hear these anti words mm. that are thrown out because somebody sent, you know, did a, a, a once again to not harping on this um that event, but just to use that in context of what, what we're dealing with right now is that you have people that are screaming anti-Semitism, anti this, anti that, anti-vaxxers, there's this, there are these anti-labels that are put on people for whatever reasons. But in situations like this, where we have this kind of documented 
proof. Where's the anti-labels mm. against those that have performed these atrocities on us and continue to do so? Wow. Where are the labels for those? Mm. No, those were justified. There was justification for, and there continue to be justification for the atrocities on us as a people. Mm. And so when, you know, during this time where there's all this, these laws are now being placed, put in, in place against anti-Semitism, do we fall under those laws? Mm. That's my question. Right. <laughs> Since we are from the seed of Shem. Mm. But for me, we need an anti-something that is not so broad, mm. right? Because anti-Semitism encompasses all of the, the descendants of Shem, which um. includes... Um, not just not just Israelites, Esau, Khan, and the Arabs, right? Khan, Ishmael. Where's the anti Judah mm. label? Because it, because it sure ain't Black Lives Matter. <laughs> <laughs> It's it sure it, yeah it sure isn't no, that. No, it's, it's not that. That we already know. Mm. That's not it. Mm, mm, so mm, where's mm. the anti-Judah? Wow. Because these people are from the seed of Judah. Hmm. So do we need do we need to now campaign for anti-Judah laws to be passed, mm. right? Right. Because everybody else seem to get laws that are passed to protect them. Where's our protection? Where were the people when we were going through these atrocities? Mm when black slaves, female slaves were used as tools, no anesthesia whatsoever mm. for doctors to perform surgeries. As if we were lab rats with no anesthesia because they, it was felt as though it was believed that we did not feel pain mm. like white people do. And that mindset has carried over yep. since then. Yep. Even, even subconsciously. I've, I've, I've seen it. I've seen how and, and I've talked about this before. I've seen how working in the prisons, how the, the, the black prisoners were treated in comparison to the white prisoners. Mm. When it came to their health care. I've seen it working in not just the, you know, Watts in the ghettos but also working with the migrant um, field workers who happen to be our Issachar brothers and sisters. Mm. So this goes really deep. It, it, it cuts really Absolutely. deep. And, and so right now, I, like I said, this book just, it, it just opened up so many emotions, so many feelings, not just as a quote unquote black woman, but as a mother, mm. Con. as a grandmother, 
and knowing how had it not been for my medical background and knowing certain things what would have happened to my children mm. and my grandchildren at the hands of medical providers? I, I mean, my, my granddaughter was pre, a preemie. She was one pound, five ounces when she was born mm. at five months. My, my daughter had her at, at five months gestation and the doctor that delivered my granddaughter advised my daughter to let her die and not put her on life support. Mm. He said, if she lives, she's going to be a vegetable or mm. she's, she's never going to walk. She's never going to talk. So I would recommend that you not put her on life support. Mm, 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 mm. And so praise the most high, my daughter has a character like like her mother. Con. And that that wasn't going to fly. Right. And she told him, you better do everything in your power to make sure that my daughter lives. As I was on an airplane traveling to where she was at. Mm. When I arrived and I saw this, I was at this, this hospital where my granddaughter was at. It was, it was a, a hospital that specialized in neonatal intensive care. Mm. So we're talking about a hospital that specializes in, in preemies. Mm. And I'm looking on the wall at all of these pictures of white babies that made it lived, that made it <laughs> that were even smaller than her mm. so what would make this doctor advise my daughter to not put my granddaughter on life support not, allow not don't her. don't even fight don't even <laughs> fight don't even fight for this one ain't that something that's the advice that he gave her Ooh. And my granddaughter went into heart surgery. She had to have heart surgery. Surgery. She had a PDA ligation when she was born. And because, like I said, we we demanded that you're going to do everything humanly possible. Absolutely. And she went in, and and they told her we have to send her to a specialized hospital to get this this done. And they said, but we're, we're, we're letting you know she's going to be at this hospital for a week because it takes about a week for them to recuperate, you know, children, this babies this small to recuperate from such a surgery. And said, okay, she went in for her surgery. She went in that morning. She had her surgery. And she came out of that surgery with flying colors. Mm. They Praise were amazed. The they were amazed. They said, "We've never seen a a, a a a an infant this small recuperate from such a surgery mm. so quickly." She was back at her main hospital wow. that sent her there that afternoon. Wow! And I had to let them know, you don't know the God that we serve. Mm. You don't know the God that we serve. And I made sure that my daughter did not talk to a provider without me being present or me being on the phone. Time. Hmm. And that's how that that's how that worked out. Right? But that's just that's just one small example. Mm. of there just so many other instances of, of medical situations in my own my own family where I had to step in and be that voice and be that voice for my family mm. and had I not been there because of 
you know, the, the most high doesn't make mistakes. And, and no. he knew the reason why he, he gave me this gift. Hmm. And it, it, it's always been to help those that couldn't help themselves to help those that didn't have a voice. Mm. And even my patients, I've always been a huge patient advocate. And because of that, I've had issues on the jobs, mm. on my jobs, because for whatever reason, I don't understand it. Why wouldn't you want a provider to advocate for, for patients? Right. And I'm not, I'm not saying this about all providers. So let me make this clear. This discussion is not to dissuade anyone from seeking medical attention. If you are someone that you know is experiencing a medical illness or an emergency, seek medical attention. There are good and even excellent medical providers out there. Absolutely. That really do want and do try their very best to treat their patients. Absolutely. At the best of their ability. I know this because I was one of those. And I worked alongside other providers that uh. were excellent providers and wanted the very best for their patients. But there are those that one bad apple that's in the bunch. Right. That if left unchecked, can spoil the entire bunch, especially if that bad apple happens to be in a position of authority and power mm. over the others. And if the others do not have the courage to speak out and to be that voice because of fear of losing their jobs. Mm. And that's, that's my situation is that I never had that fear. I never had that fear. I've left jobs willingly. I've walked away from jobs willingly because I was not being allowed to, to do what was in the best interest of my patient. And, and to me, that, that did not make much sense. Right. Right? So going back to the book, so have looking at my experience and reading this book that's why there was so many emotions because now these emotions were really validated con when i read this book con to see that oh this isn't just me hmm. this isn't just me um you know this isn't just some small situation over here where you just happen to you know run across these experiences no we have a whole book full of a whole proof book. right here <laughs> so you know and and but like i said this information is to is to be used as a reminder of what has happened and in some instances continue to happen, just as Absolutely. our sister Harriet Washington stated. Absolutely. And she's a ethicist. Mm. She did a plethora of research. So mm -hmm. she should know. So I just want those that are listening or may come across this video later on to use this information as a guide to lead you. I want you to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves when you're Absolutely. out there. And above all, pray, pray first before making any decision that can in impact your health and safety. Pray first because your life could depend on it. Mm. So since, since you've come across this information, what do you, you know, how do you plan to navigate? What, how do you plan to use this information um, going forward? Yeah, Akawath, um, definitely, you know, plan on um, continuously researching 
you know, um, we're, we're at definitely at a time to where there shouldn't be a such thing as I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, there is now a thing called let me find out <laughs> because the information is out there for you. Um, I'm definitely, you know, um, especially reading this book and listening to the audio of this book, I, never again or, you know, will I be um, ignorant to what really goes on and when it comes to our people. Sis, when I read that part where, oh, I didn't know black women felt pain. <laughs> like, what, you know what I'm saying? Where did you guys get this from? You, you're screaming at the, the, the top of your lungs. You're screaming at the top. This woman is on a table. On a table. Mm -hmm. Surrounded by white coats. And she's screaming at the top of her lungs to the point to where you guys have to have nurses and by and the and this other the other slaves standing around her hold her down mm -hmm. because she's in agony. Mm -hmm. And you mean to tell me, oh, I I don't I didn't know black women feel pain. So it <laughs> for this experimental study to have gone back as far as eighteen forties, uh, maybe even before then. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely not. Like this is. You know, so, and I mean, there's, there's um, all kind of experiences. There was, there was just that YouTube, um, that Judah YouTuber um, that was pregnant. I don't know if you've heard of that, that died <laughs> in, uh, in 2020. So, I mean, the, the young woman was 24 years of age. Oh my goodness. Eight months pregnant with a, with a boy. Judah family. Did, did my video did my video um stop? No, your video's still going. Okay. Huh. Something popped up on my screen saying we were having difficulty. Mm. Okay. Yeah. It's gone. I mean it's gone now. Okay. I, I mean it it just it continues. It continues. There's so many I've had my um, sisters, um, I've had sister-in-law stories. I've had sibling mm -hmm. stories where mm -hmm. it's like, you know, I'm telling, I'm screaming at the doctor, telling them I'm in pain. Can you give me this? Can you guys do this? And it's like, oh, no, you, you'll be fine. You're all right. We're just gonna do this here. No, you need to do something for this pain. I'm not a machine. I'm not an animal. Con, con. And so, yeah, it, it definitely, it shins, sends shivers up your spine. It brings you into this emotion of um, not being able to trust, not, not knowing what to do. Like, how, how, how do you expect the people to trust you? Right. How do you expect, how can you demonize people for not trusting you when this is the history of, of, the of history. you? <laughs> this is the history that we have. This you isn't know. lies that we found. This no. is the truth. We have the proof. We have the proof of this. So it's just like, I, you know what I'm saying? You're going to demonize people. You, you get a campaign going and you demonize people for not being able to trust you. And we have more than the Tuskegee experiment to go on, to base those assumptions on, to base that fear or not, not being able to trust you on. So it's huh. just, it is, it is mind boggling. Like th this, it, it is is so disgusting. I I. Huh. It's like, yeah. It's quite disturbing. How quite. dare you demonize anyone? Mm -hmm. When the when the demonic presence, it was always with you. You know what? I want to read something from this book because this mm. Doctor Sims this um. This Dr. Sims, James Marion Sims, he is known it as the, basically he, he is known as the, the inventor of modern gynecology. Mm. And this is the same Dr. Sims that mm -hmm. did all of these experiments on our sisters back then without anesthesia. Wow. And 
Let me read this part here. Mm. On a sylvan stretch of New York's Patrician Upper Fifth Avenue, just across from the New York Academy of Medicine, a colossus of marble, August in inscription, and bas relief caduces, caduces grace a memorial bordering Central Park. These laurels venerate the surgeon James Marion Sims, MD, as a selfless benefactor of women. Nor is this the only statuary erected in honor of Dr. Sims. Marble monuments to his skills, benevolence, and humanity guard his native South Carolina State House, its medical school, the Alabama Capitol Grounds, and a French hospital. In the mid 19th century, Dr. Sims dedicated his career to the care and cure of women's disorders and opened the nation's first hospital for women in New York, in New York City. He attended French royalty. His Grecian visage inspired old, old portraits. In the 1875, he was elected president of the American Medical Association. Hospitals still bear his name, including a West African hospital that utilizes the eponymous gynecological instruments that he first invented for surgeries upon black female slaves in the 1840s. But this benevolent image vies with the detached Marion Sims portrait in Robert Tom's J. Marion Sims gynecological surgeon, an oil representation of an experimental surgery upon his powerless slave, Betsy. Sims stands aloof, arms folded, one hand holding a metroscope, which is the forerunner to the speculum, as he regards the kneeling woman in a coolly evaluative medical gaze. His tie and morning coat contrast with her simple servant's dress, head rag and bare feet. His tie. Mm. The painting commissioned and distributed by the Park Davis Pharmaceutical House more than a century after the surgeries as one of its A History of Medicine in Pictures series takes telling liberties with the historical facts. So it goes on to talk about this, this picture. You know what, let, let me just read it. It's, it's, a little, it's a little bit lengthy, but it's important that I, I get this information in there. Tom portrays Betsy as a fully clothed, calm slave woman who kneels complacently on a small table, hand modestly raised to her breast before a trio of white male physicians. Two other slave women peer around a sheet, apparently hung for modesty's sake, in a childlike display of curiosity. This innocuous tableau could hardly differ more from the gruesome reality in which each surgical scene was a violent struggle between the slaves and physicians and each woman's body was a bloodied battleground. Each naked, unanesthetized mm. slave woman had to be forcibly restrained by the other physicians through her shrieks of agony as Sims determinedly sliced, then sutured her genitalia. The other doctors who, who could fled when they could bear the horrific scenes no longer. It then fell to the woman to restrain one another. So then Harriet goes on to say, I wanted to reproduce Tom's painting on the cover of this book or at least in the text. But when I ask permission of its copyright holder, Pfizer Inc., mm. the company insisted on reviewing the entire manuscript of this book before making a decision. As an independent scholar, I could not acquiesce to this and I used another cover image. When I renewed my request to use the image within the text, Pfizer agreed to base its decision upon reading this chapter 
and an outline of the book. The Pfizer executives apparently were uncomfortable with what they read because they refused to grant permission to reproduce this telling image or even mm. respond to my query after I supplied the requested chapter and outline. Mm. This act of censorship exemplifies the barriers some choose to erect in order to veil the history of unconscionable medical research with Blacks. Wow. Why would Pfizer refuse to do that? Wow. Why? <laughs> mm, censorship. And censorship. And now with the campaign, all of these things are coming together and making sense. Mm-hmm. And we're supposed to be stupid. <laughs> some tea. I had to drink some tea. Yeah, I had to drink mm -hmm. some tea for that. Mm. Why would why would they have a problem with that? Why would they have a problem with this book? Why? It's only dealing with truth. Hmm. But once again, it's not about truth, is it? Mm -mm. It's not about truth. No, it's not. Not for them anyway. <laughs> <laughs> There's one other video that I want to show. And this video is of Martin Luther King, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Mm -hmm. And this was 11 months before his assassination. I want you to listen to the words that he used here. Wow. And um, yeah, let's, let's listen to this. And it's only going to be a short, I think three, four, maybe four minutes. Okay. And this is also fair use for educational purposes only. Segregation is people devoid of thinking they're devoid of racism. Do you have any idea of what they want the Negro to be in America? Let me just scroll it back just a little bit. Where we have moved from a struggle for decency, which characterized our struggle for 10 or 12 years, to a struggle for genuine equality. And this is where we are getting the resistance because there was never any intention uh, to go this far. People were reacting to Bull Connor and to Jim Clark rather than acting in good faith for the realization of genuine equality. Do you think white people in this country, and I'm talking about non-segregationists, people devoid of thinking they're devoid of racism, do you have any idea of what they want the Negro to be in America? Well, it depends on the level that we are talking here, uh, because I think you have to make a distinction between the people who are genuinely and absolutely committed in the white community on the question of of racial equality. And I must confess that I think they're in a very small minority. I think the vast majority of white Americans uh, will go but so far. It's a kind of installment plan for equality. And uh, they are always looking for an excuse uh, to go but so far. Why are they looking for the excuse? What is it about the Negro? I mean, every other group that came as an immigrant somehow, not easily, but somehow got around it. Is it just the fact that Negroes are black? That's a part of it. And growing, that grows out of something else. You can't thingify anything without depersonalizing that something. If you use something as a means to an end, at that moment, you make it a thing and you depersonalize it. The fact is that the Negro was a slave in this country for 244 years. That act, uh, that was uh, a willful thing that was done. The Negro was brought here and changed, treated in very human fashion. 
And this led to the thingification of the Negro. So he was not looked upon as a person. He was not looked upon as a human being with the same uh, status and worth as other human beings. And the other thing is that human beings cannot continue to do wrong without eventually uh, rationalizing that wrong. So slavery was justified morally, biologically, uh, theoretically, scientifically, everything else. And it seems to me that white America must see that no other ethnic group has been a slave on American soil. Uh, that is one thing that other immigrant groups haven't had to face. The other thing is that the color became a stigma. American society made the Negroes color a stigma. And uh, that can never be uh, overlooked. So I think these things are absolutely necessary. The other thing is that America freed the slaves in 19, I mean 1863 through the Emancipation Proclamation of Abraham Lincoln, but gave the slaves no land or nothing in reality, and as a matter of fact, to, to get started on. At the same time, America was giving away millions of acres of land in the West and the Midwest, which meant that there was a willingness to give the white peasants from Europe an economic base. And yet it refused to give its black peasants from Africa who came here involuntarily in chains and had worked free for 244 years any kind of economic base. And so emancipation for the Negro was really freedom to hunger. It was freedom uh, to the winds and rains of heaven. It was freedom without food to eat or land to cultivate, and therefore it was freedom and famine at the same time. And when white Americans tell the Negro to lift himself by his own bootstraps, they don't, oh, they don't look over the legacy of slavery and segregation. I believe we ought to do all we can and seek to lift ourselves by our own bootstraps. But uh, it's a cruel jest to say to a bootless man that he ought to lift himself by his own bootstraps. And many Negroes, by the thousands and millions, have been left bootless as a result of all of these years of oppression and as a result of a society that deliberately made his color a stigma and something worthless and degrading. Apart from wanting... Oh, wait. <laughs> if that if that Martin Luther King didn't know how to speak so eloquently very very man. eloquently the thingification Ooh. of the Negro when I heard that hmm. I said that explains it hmm. we have been thingified con We've been thingified. You don't feel pain because you're a thing. Mm. We can do anything that we want to you because you're just a thing. Mm. Oh, we. We don't owe you anything because you're a thing. Mm. And even back then, look at how it was brought out that immigrants from other mm -hmm. countries can come in and they did not experience anything like we have like experienced. we did mm -hmm. so how is it that now they get to get on the bandwagon mm. of civil rights wow when their civil rights were not infringed upon like ours were. Hmm. How is it that they, hmm. they get to be a part of this? Ooh. Hmm. Mm -mm -mm. Uh, it, it, <laughs> mind you know, mind-boggling. I mind -boggling, I, uh, I'm, I'm struggling to find Definitely words bastard. here because that whole thing about the thingification of the Negro—that really, yep, 
that says it all. Yeah, that validated a lot. Um, a lot. So yeah, it, that there's no wonder why such a book has been written. There's no wonder why all of these experimentations were done on us because we were looked at and I, in my belief, we're still looked at in that light. Mm -hmm. Objects to be used as tools for others to, to gain from. To gain. Mm -hmm. That's what you do with a thing. Yep. That's what you do with, with a fork. A fork is a thing. Yep. This thing is only you don't, used to... You don't care about it. You don't love yeah, it. Absolutely. You're using it. That is you it. You use it. <laughs> it's here to, for me to use in order for me mm. to eat. So it's, it's just a thing. It has no feelings. Mm. I get to do whatever I want to with it. I, I can throw it in the trash if, if, if I don't want it anymore. If it's broken, guess what? I can just throw it away because it's broken. And that's the thing, because, you know, it, it's always this talk of, you know, we should just forget about the race thing. These people made it a race thing. Absolutely. We didn't. It wasn't a problem as long as they were doing it, as long as everything was about race for them. Okay. So it's just, it's so... It's a lot, like I said, and is is the fact that we have to constantly take all of this in and can and can sit up here and be flawless <laughs> and, and and to be told, oh, get That's over it, to, yeah. to to get over it, you know. But others, other mm. situation, we won't forget. We won't forget. We won't forget this. We won't forget that every opportunity that others get to to bring up their atrocities, they bring it up and the whole world stops. The whole world listens. Mm -hmm. The whole world caters to them. Yep. Whole world needs to wear a specific T-shirt. Whole whole world needs to put out a, a, a specific hashtag. Con. But and when we, we yeah. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. What boots? Can you what? give me some boots first? Can you give me <laughs> <laughs> I need the boots. You need the boots. He said a boot. You tell a bootless man to pull huh. up bootstraps. When they don't even have boots. Mm. And I've seen homeless men with boots with no straps. Mm -hmm. Just... So even if you have the boots and you don't have any straps to 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 pull it up, you've only got part of the problem solved. Mm. So wow. I'm yeah. going to I'm going to take a, a brief break. Okay. And when we come back. I would like for sisters out there that are watching, that are listening, I want I want you to come on and, and, and come on the video and, and tell us your experience. How did, what, what emotions did this book evoke in you when you read it or when you listened to it? Um, what do you plan to do with the information now that you have this information? Hmm. How do we move forward? Because we're not, we've never been and we never will be. We will never allow what they have done to us to turn us into them. No, not at all. Because we are God's chosen people. Absolutely. Right? And we knew, we now know mm -hmm. the reason why. The reason why. Mm -hmm. We have been subjected to this type of treatment. Yep. To such and atrocities. It, 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 it goes back to us, 
turning our backs on our God. Come on. So the answer is, to un in order to undo what's been done, the only answer is to come back to our God. Absolutely. And I'm talking about following his laws, his statutes, his commandments, repenting for our sins. Those sins of our forefathers and foremothers. Mm. Repenting. Con. And turning away completely from those sins. Mm. That's the only way. That is the only way. And he's sitting back there just like this. <laughs> Arms open Waiting, wide, like, come on. And he's waking us up on. throughout the four <laughs> corners of the earth. And that come is on. why information like this is coming out. Mm. Information like this is coming out. All Everything has to be exposed. Yep. In order for the healing to begin, mm. we have to address these issues. We have to know the reasons why we think the way we do and wh why we do the things that we do. Mm-hmm. Because some of us didn't really know why is it that I feel so uncomfortable hmm. when, you know, there's this thing called white coat hypertension. Hmm. When you go in to see your doctor and your blood pressure just goes out the roof. Mm -hmm. Why? Hmm. This person is here to help you. Why is it that you go hmm. in to see someone that's here to help you and your blood pressure goes out the mm. roof, where they actually have to give it a name mm -hmm. white coat hypertension mm -hmm. yep all along there was something in us that is telling us not to trust mm. we we're remembering <laughs> we're remembering not to trust Mm. And so we have to know the reasons why in order to fix these problems. So we're going to take a break. Um, and I, I just want us to think about what we just heard, what we just saw, and just start thinking about ways that we, we can fix these issues. We can't go back in time and undo what was done. But now that we have the information, what do we do? What do we mm. do with this? For those that haven't read the book, that haven't gotten the book, I highly, highly recommend getting this book, reading it. There's just so much information in here that we cannot delve into completely. There's just so much mm. information and sis got receipts sister harriet got receipts sister harriet <laughs> she brought all the receipts, receipts. she brought it mm -hmm. and then she has other books out there as well yes dealing on similar topics so she is one to follow for sure absolutely and um to get her books because she is putting herself out there on the line to bring us this information. Mm. We have no excuses. We have no excuses. We need, we need to take advantage of the information that we're given. It's like having a Bible that just sits on your shelf and you never open it up. Mm. How do you know what's in that Bible if you don't read it? If you don't read it. Come open on. these books, open these books that are here to help us. Turn off the television, turn off the television and just have, just dedicate one day a week to just reading. No television, no social media, none of that. And just dedicate one day a week. You know the difference that will make if we just dedicate mm. one day to reading a book? Come so that's the challenge that I'm going to put out there. Dedicate one day. That being said, let's take a short break. We'll be right back and 
sisters, I want you all to be to get video ready to come on here and and let's let's have this conversation. Sip some tea and let's continue this conversation. And if you haven't already done so, hit the like button, share and subscribe and we'll be right back. Come on, Aqua. <laughs> All right. All right. Tea Time with Shibu Royalty features remedies for inner healing and outer beauty. Real-time conversations with sisters in the Hebrew Israelite community focused on healing our spirit, mind, and body, which will contribute to the strengthening of our nation as a whole. Join me, your hostess, Akwak Kuala Yakaka, sip a cup of tea, wear your favorite turban, tea, or tunic, and enjoy tea time with Shibu royalty. True healing begins inwardly before it is expressed outwardly. Hit the like button, share, and subscribe so that you and others won't miss an episode of these life-enhancing discussions. Shalom. Tea Time with Shibu Royalty features remedies for inner healing and outer beauty. Real-time conversations with sisters in the Hebrew Israelite community focused on healing our spirit, mind, and body, which will contribute to the strengthening of our nation as a whole. Join me, your hostess, Akwak Kuala Yakaka, sip a cup of tea, wear your favorite turban, tea, or tunic, and enjoy tea time with Shibu royalty. True healing begins inwardly before it is expressed outwardly. Hit the like button, share, and subscribe so that you and others won't miss an episode of these life-enhancing discussions. Shalom. Tea Time with Shibu Royalty features remedies for inner healing and outer beauty. Real-time conversations with sisters in the Hebrew Israelite community focused on healing our spirit, mind, and body, which will contribute to the strengthening of our nation as a whole. Join me, your hostess, Akwak Kuala Yakaka, sip a cup of tea, Wear your favorite turban, tea, or tunic, and enjoy tea time with Shibu royalty. True healing begins inwardly before it is expressed outwardly. Hit the like button, share, and subscribe so that you and others won't miss an episode of these life-enhancing discussions. Shalom. Tea Time with Shibu Royalty features remedies for inner healing and outer beauty. 
real-time conversations with sisters in the Hebrew Israelite community, focused on healing our spirit, mind, and body, which will contribute to the strengthening of our nation as a whole. Join me, your hostess, Akwak Kuala Yakaka, sip a cup of tea, wear your favorite turban, tea, or tunic, and enjoy Tea Time with Shebrew Royalty. True healing begins inwardly before it is expressed outwardly. Hit the like button, share, and subscribe. We are back. We are back. Can you hear me okay, Aqua? Calm, I can. Okay. I can hear you. Right. Let me. Um, very good. Let's look at. So, let's check out some of the responses that we received. Let's see. Sister Jeanette says. Let's see here. She said it upset me because our people were the guinea pigs for the medical procedures. We, we have, have today. today. Uh huh. Yes. Yeah, used yeah. us to yeah to 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 learn how to do specific surgeries. Come. So you wouldn't have the knowledge of any of it had you not used <laughs> where. Come on, my, my question is, where's, 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 I was about to say, where's, where's the, where's the where's money? My, where's my, my money for, for this? Where's, where's the money? Come on. I mean, I mean just reading, even just the, to see the experiment, when you go into, when you go into the real history, mm -hmm. not, not the history that you see on the TV, Con. you know, what was that movie? Was it the, Tuskegee Airmen, right, right. Yes. Um, Red Tails, yeah. With when they did the, the yeah the Tuskegee Airmen, yeah. When you when you they really, left that part out of that. When you read all of the details in this book about mm. that experiment, when you read about, um, you know, when when they go into the the graveyards and. Mm dig up the bodies and, and you've given so many people money you've 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 done this uh, asian hate campaign where is our money for this exactly we, it has been proven that you've used us for experiments for surgeries that you use today where is the money that and we even in death come on even in our death there was they used us even after mm. we were dead went into the graveyards, dug up bodies mm, mm, and mm, donated mm. them to universities, cadavers to universities. Sister People said, were, Sister Harriet said, the, the kids are like, I don't wanna, <laughs> well, I'm not trying to do this on this woman. Con. Oh, she's, she's unconscious. She's in for surgery for something oh else. Oh my God. And imagine all of these medical students, a, a woman that is laying there that like, like one of the students says, cannot object, first of all. Mm. Did not give permission, first Where's of all. Where's her consent? Right. No consent. So you that, bring her in here laid lead, out. That should lead every one of us to wonder what happens when we go in into surgery mm. has, this, has this stopped completely mm. are there rogue doctors out there that are still allowing this practice School what's happening when our sisters and brothers are in comas are you taking them huh. to universities since since they're not going to wake up till you know this year or or you know we're, we're, you're waiting on them to wake up what is going on? Oh yeah, I, that prompts me to look into that, Aqua. When when, when you're unconscious, mm. what is going on? People wake up and, and and come out of surgeries with thoughts, with wondering, did this really happen? And. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, this is disturbing. 
Yeah. Very, very disturb disturbing. This has opened up a whole new can of worms. Sister Karash says, Karash, Shalom, my sister. Shalom, Shalom Akwat. Shalom. Miss Shay says, Shalom, Akwat Yam, looking lovely. The water, the water. <laughs> The water. Yes, this this really opens up a whole other can of worms. Oh right? yeah. Oh yeah. And even to the point where people started going to the grave sites to check to see if their loved ones mm, are still there. Mm. How inhumane is that? Like how disrespectful. In life and in death, hmm. disrespected, no value. Do we have any sister out there that wants to come on on, on video and and give your your commentary about this topic? Talk about what what feelings, what emotions were evoked. What do you think about the book? What are your plans moving forward on how to how to share this information? For those, my challenge is for those medical providers out there that may come across this video, is to get this book. Get this book and read for yourself. This way you get to know what your patients, their thoughts, their feelings, and talk to your patients about this. If you are a provider of a quote unquote black patient, start the conversation with them. Bring them at ease to let them know that you are aware of the atrocities that have been done in the past. Mm -hmm. However, you are doing everything in your power to ensure that history does not repeat itself. Con. Put them at ease. You can do this. Right. Because your silence means that you are complicit. If you now know this history and you are silent, you have you have become complicit because you are withholding information. Mm. Yeah, and, and look at it and don't don't ever question us again. Don't ever question our our distrust and don't don't question that. Look read it for yourself. Look into it for yourself before you try to demonize us for being skeptical Con. of our health, of our bodies. Whenever you roll something out, whenever you oh. roll something out that has not been You're sitting back proven. and laughing and, and I just don't understand these people. Why wouldn't you just get something right. that, you know, no, this is why. This is why. This is why I want someone to trust you. Show me, prove to me that you're worthy of my trust. And you providers out there that are hearing others of your colleagues, your your co-workers, ridiculing patients and talking down about the patients, stand up, speak out, be that voice for that patient. Con. Be that voice. That's what we are called to do. You have to be an advocate for your patient. Do not ever allow anyone to do anything to your patient that is under your care that you know is unethical. Hmm. Do not allow that. Aqua, there was a part in chapter one where, where they were talking about the vaginal surgeries were done consistently on the black slaves to where they had to be addicted to morphine. 
the, the doctor had to get them, had to have them be addicted to morphine in order to be even used for the experiment. Come. So this is addiction that you've done. You know, it, it's. Um, uh, there was a story in here. Just go and just go and go, and it's it's absolutely disgusting. There was another story in here about a little boy that had an injury to his private area, hmm. and it was a it was a minor injury. Hmm. However, the doctor used chloroform to an to anesthetize him and removed his testicle mm. when it was a superficial it was a superficial injury wow and it was it was days later when the little boy realized because he was all bandaged up when he realized that that surgery was performed where his mm. testicle was removed without the consent of his parents for no other reason other than the doctor ended up writing a, a, a paper, writing an article for a journal on the effects of chloroform mm. used in castration. Mm. So he did that only to be able to write wow. an article in a journal. And used as a guinea pig without his knowledge. A, used as a guinea pig. And many of the stories in here, that's what, what it talks about. The doctors, not only were they doing this for experimentation purposes, but also so they can gain credibility by writing articles mm. from medical journals to gain credibility. Where is that boy's family's money for the book, for the <coughs> article? Exactly. Ooh. But once again, he was thingified. Mm. His parents were his parents were thingified. Because when you're a thing, we get to use you as we see fit. Mm -hmm. So I don't mm -hmm. want to hear about anybody's atrocities. No disrespect to anyone. But I don't think there's a book written about any other race of people that mm. have gone through what we have gone through and what we continue to go through. Huh. I know that there are others that have had things happen to them that were atrocious as well. Hmm. And we're not here to compare. However, when you keep putting your stuff out there, hmm. as you know, showing that you've been a victim, you need to think about those of us out here who have been victims as well and have proof that we were victimized on a higher level. Mm -hmm. And we continue to, to experience these things. Mm. So when you when you politicians are out there writing laws to benefit other people, what about us? Hmm. When you are given, when you have money to give away for reparations for other people, what about us? Hmm. And and not that we're sitting here holding our breath waiting for reparations because we know that's not going to happen. Oh no, we'd be dead by now. <laughs> that is that is not going to we'd happen. We'd be dead, yeah, by now. Because we already know our the only redeemer 
the only one that can pay the cost and that has paid the cost because the cost is so high mm. for what we have experienced Ooh. that you couldn't afford us. Mm. You could, you cannot afford to pay what is owed to us. And they don't have to answer to us, uh, uh, Akwathkala. They're going to answer to our God. And that's what I'm saying. <laughs> Christ has paid gonna, the price. Yeah, you're going to answer to our God. We know. Christ. We see you. Khan. Yep. We He's know. He's paid the price, right? Yep. His blood. We know who you are. There's no censoring. There's no covering up anymore. The truth is out of the bag. The bag has Come. been brought forth and you don't, Come. we don't have to, we don't have, we don't have to do anything. Come. You answer to our God. Absolutely. How about that? <laughs> and the price, the price has been paid. Oh yeah. And we share the same blood mm. as Yeshia Christ that shed his blood Ooh. to redeem us. That's the only redemption. Con. The only redemption. And we just praise our God, Ahaya. The water for sending Ahaya. his son to redeem us from this hell. I mean, it's like when you when you don't think it could get any worse. When you don't think that a that a people can be any any worse to another people, Con. it's like yeah, you're wrong. <laughs> uh, we have this. You forgot about this part, Con. And it's 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 so yeah. And for you, us to still, to sis, you know we we have to be the people mm. because I mean look at. Look at Yeshua when he was on the cross, when he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. What they do. These people had just flogged him, spat on him, beat him, mm. crucifying him. And he said, forgive them. Mm. And look at us as a people. As a people, we are the we are the most forgiving, mm. the most loving, the most caring, in spite of everything that mm. we have been through and we continue to go through. Con. We still don't walk around with bitterness, with anger, with hatred. We've not become mass murderers. Mm. Con. Right? We we pick up the pieces that we have and we keep it moving. There's no genocide on any people with it with our what our in our hands are dripped in, in the you know, no. No. Not no. happening. <laughs> I mean, even I, I would I would like for you all to watch the full interview with Dr. Martin Luther King. Mm. And before we got to the point where I started the video, one of the things that the interviewer said to Dr. Martin Luther King, he was asking him about um, using violence. Has it ever been a thought to use violence? <clears throat> against the white people mm. for what they've done. And th this, this um, interviewer said to him, but we know that the white man has the monopoly, owns the monopoly on violence. This came out of the mouth of a white man. Mm. We didn't say that. Dr. Martin Luther King didn't say that. Mm -hmm. watch, the, watch the full interview. And Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, no, that was never an option. 
He said, morally, I couldn't do that. Mm. And he said, not only morally, but we don't have the means. Come on. To inflict <laughs> violence. Mm. He's, at that time, he said, we are 11% of the population. Come on. How can we match the white man with violence? Mm. We have no weapons. I mean, so these, these are the wow. things that people need to think about when they're mm -hmm. putting out there that we are harming or have plans to harm other people right and they're with so what? scared they're so afraid that we're going to turn around and do do what what are, with what do what with what with what <laughs> right oh man and they know that aqua they know that they know that but it gives them reason to continue to do what they've done all mm -hmm. along mm -hmm. and that's what once again, going back to that video, Dr. Martin Luther King said as well, is now when you have thingified someone and you've deep, you you've you know no longer you no lo longer look at them as a person, mm. it justifies what you do and what how you're you doing. treat mm -hmm. them. So that being said, we we don't hate anyone. We we do not hate anyone. What we have done is we take accountability accountability for the role that we played. That's right. As a people in our condition. And once again, it goes back to that Bible. So if you're not reading that Bible, you need to read that Bible. You need mm -hmm. to read Deuteronomy 28 that explains all of the atrocity that the Most High warned us will befall us for turning our backs on him and following false gods so when we get to that place and we realize that there is a cure for this disease basically mm. that there's a cure for it and the only cure is getting back to our god when you uh. realize that that you cannot go into a president and begging him for money is not going to do it marching nope. up and down the streets is not nope. it hasn't done it nope it's never done it it's never been the answer mm. going out there and, and and showing that you have some kind of militant um Con. background or what what have you right a presence a military military presence that's laughable right the only way is to surrender mm. to our God, get on our knees and on. pray for our God to send Yeshia to deliver us. That's on. the only deliverance that we have. That's the only thing that we have to look forward to. That's the one and only. That's it. <laughs> In mm. the meantime, we keep praying, we keep fasting. We keep following the law, statutes, and commandments of the Most High God. We continue to pray. We, we, you know, we have our elders, our bishops, deacons, our officers that are, you know, they're the watchmen. Absolutely. They're, they're the watchmen. And they're Absolutely. watching over the flock. And we need to take heed. We need to listen when they speak. We, because they are they are truly connected mm. to the Most High God. They are truly right. listening to the Rawak. Praise, praise the Most High. Mm. And until we get to that place where we humble ourselves and turn from our wicked ways. Mm. That's the answer. That is the answer. Nothing else. Hmm. So, says, I, I mean, <laughs> this has been an amazing show. We haven't <laughs> had anyone come on, but, um, you know, I hope that you sisters out there, that you 
have learned something, you have gained something. If you haven't already gotten the book, I once again want to encourage you to get this book. And we may revisit this, this topic at, at a later time again, just to see you know, if others have had the opportunity to read this book. And we may just decide to revisit this again when we when we do the review on Miller's review of critical vaccine studies. Mm -hmm. I don't have a, a specific date for this yet, but at some point this book will be reviewed and we may touch on medical apartheid again, just to see where we sit. Yeah. Also, I want to do a very quick um, poll for our next week's topic. And I want you sisters out there to help us out. Um, we, we, there are three topics that I am considering that Sister um, Aquat Sierra and I have discussed that we have narrowed it down from the 60 something topics that we have. Oh no, I think, I think the topics are now like 80 something topics that we have. <laughs> and we've narrowed it down to three that we would like to present. So here are the three topics to choose from. And I want you to place your vote in the chat. We want to do this really quick because I know it's getting late. It's after eight already. And I know other, you know, a lot of people have to go to work tomorrow. But um, here are the three topics to choose from. Topic A, sisterhood becoming our sister's keeper. We'll talk about how do we do this? I mean, this is a, this Tea Time with Sheba Royalty is about sisterhood. It's about us getting together and talking about these topics that are so relevant to us and um, helping each other through these times. So A, sisterhood, becoming our sister's keeper. B, Babylon is falling, but Israel is rising. What are you doing to prepare? Mm. That's B. And C, fruits of the spirit. Are we bearing them? Mm. So these are the three topics that I want us to choose from for next week. Sisterhood, becoming our sister's keeper. That's choice A, choice B, Babylon is falling, but Israel is rising. What are you doing to prepare? And C, fruits of the spirit, are we bearing them? So give me an A, B, or C in, in the chat. And let's, let's see where where we land. Cast your vote now. The winner will be the topic of our discussion next week. So Aqua Sierra, what do you think? What do you what do you think about the topics? They're so um they're good. They they're really um like I said they they they're perfect for for uh Shebrew royalty. Um the becoming our sister's keeper, um, the preparation of one, um, the fruits of the spirit, they're all very important. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, all of them are, are really good. I'm excited to see what the sisters end up putting in the chat for it. <laughs> um, to figure out which one. And, and this is going to be the one that we do for next week. For next week. Okay. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I'm excited to see what the sisters end up choosing in there or what their um, options are in the chat. Let's see, did we get anyone, no votes yet? Let me see. Is there, I wonder if there's a lag with, um, yeah, or maybe, us. yeah. Because we, let's see, when was the last, 753 was the last time we had, okay. 
at anyone in the chat. Okay. So if we don't get a response, then what we may do is I may just decide to surprise everyone. Okay, let's see. Ba'ara Anawa, Ba'ara Anawa. Okay, she the says the first one. one. So A. First one, A. Being our, become, yep, being our becoming sister's, our sister's keeper. keeper. Very good. The water, the water, Akwad, for your vote. <clears throat> Anyone else? Now is the time to let your voice be heard. Miss Shay, bring your get your vote in. Sister Jeanette, if you're still there, get your vote in. Sister Dee Dee. Get your vote in. Yeah, this this has been this has been a very stimulating conversation, Aqua. The um, water. It's always it's always such a pleasure to to have you on here with me. <laughs> I mean <laughs> You're you're just so amazing. You're just so amazing. I just I just thank you for all the support that you always give me. You know, you you've been you've been amazing. The water, the water, and so of you. I'm so happy that you have me on here and um, you know, allowing me to to be here with you. Um, okay, looks like Sister Dee Dee says, I like them all. She says, I feel each of them is very important, but since it is something to which I'm giving much thought to lately, I'm voting for B. So nice. B is, oh, <laughs> okay. So we have one. Oh, fantastic. We have A and we have B. We have B, yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. Do we have a C or do we have a tiebreaker from A or B? Hmm. And remember C is um, fr the fruits of the spirit. See, as fruits of the spirits, are we bearing them? Oh, good grief. What on earth? Was that trolls? <laughs> you know? <laughs> I mean, does the devil have nothing else to do? Oh, my goodness. I am sure that if, you know, uh, uh, if, you know, this devil just needs to go away. <laughs> <laughs> Always come creeping. It's all slimy, Always. nasty looking. <laughs> I mean, this is, nasty this head is insane. Up. How, how do you, how do you even find us? Mm. How do you, I mean, three pop-ups there, three. <laughs> Aqua said, how do you even find us? <laughs> <laughs> what, what is your deal? <laughs> Have you we, nothing else we, better to do? We have, you know, we oh, don't, man. we don't entertain you. <laughs> <laughs> we don't entertain you. Let me see how can I remove this nonsense. Mm -mm. Put in timeout. Block user. Block user. I don't. You're not even a user. Well, <laughs> probably are a user. Okay, blocked. <clears throat> So we have, I'm sitting here wondering what. <laughs> so I'm sitting here wondering what in the heck. <laughs> the, 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 the devil is busy. Oh, the yeah. devil is busy as usual. <laughs> you know, I mean, I didn't even know that that kind of like, nonsense. Yeah, you knew we, that we, you, we were that, on here. Glad you you've heard about Shebrew Royalties channel. I'm so happy. <laughs> yeah. Glad you heard about us. I guess I guess we are now becoming a threat. Right. You only Con. attack something that's a threat. Con. With no photo. Mm -mm. Con. <laughs> just foolishness. Just, <laughs> just foolishness. My goodness. These to bots. gigabyte land you go. 
<laughs> These bots, they're working overtime. Oh, they're working overtime <laughs> in, a, in a sweatshop, like like Elder, like Elder be saying. <laughs> sweatshop, no shoes on. <laughs> oh my goodness! So we have, mm. you know, we're we've got two. So okay. we've got A and B, and I was hoping that we could get a tiebreaker. Um, but so far no tiebreakers. So, um, where do we want to go from here? <laughs> Aqua? Mm. Because they're both, they're both good. Like we said, all three of them are good. So maybe, maybe what we can maybe, do. Yeah. Maybe next, the next, uh, broadcast. Yep. We can do ask the question again, pose the question again and have, um, the ladies do another, you know, do another vote. And these or, aquaths that already voted, you know, can keep, you know, um, put their votes in again, you know, and again, or we can already kind of have those, you know, or, handy. Or what we can do is mm -hmm. A for next week and B for the following week. We can do and that. And then after that, then we put out a, another poll at that point. That'll work. So, yeah. yes, this is what we'll do. So next week we'll do sisterhood, becoming our sister's keeper, A, and then B, the following week, Babylon is falling, but Israel is rising. What are you doing to prepare? Mm -hmm. So that's how we'll do that. So we'll have two weeks already planned out of what the topic is going to be. And then after the second week, then we can vote again. Con. Con? That sounds like a plan. <laughs> sounds like a plan because it's, you know, it's, it's getting, it's getting late. And uh, I know some people probably already had to leave and um, start getting ready for work tomorrow. Sister Didi says, and A and B are from mother and daughter. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh, that's awesome. Beautiful. <laughs> that is wonderful. So perfect. Perfect. The water. Yeah. And then um, usually I know when um, I know last week when I missed it, um, I went back to watch it. So, yeah, maybe we'll even get votes in the in the main chat, you know, um, uh, for those. Yeah. For those Aquathiam that you know, missed or um, didn't catch it, you know, wh wh while it was on or why it was live. So that'll be awesome too. But yeah, oh, we can, it. we can always do that. I like the idea of doing one and then the other. So that John. works. So we'll do that. And mm -hmm. so we already have two weeks planned out because I like doing the two weeks plan ahead because sometimes having to do the research on certain things, it gives me time to do, to do the research. So I can um, focus on one now and then focus on the other um, right after. So that's what we'll do from here on out. The most high willing, we'll do two weeks at a time. That works. Yeah. So Aquatium, we've come to the end of another amazing tea <laughs> time with Shebrew Royalty broadcast. Mm-hmm. Praise the Most High for Praise bringing us together high. once again. I just thank him. Mm. A huge to the water to you, Aquath, once again <laughs> for for everything, for your support, your love, your your sisterhood, your friendship. I mean, just everything for you, for you being you, mm. your amazing <laughs> self. <laughs> oh, Tawada, and same to you, Akwath. Um, I love you, Ahabatha. I, I love you so much. Um, I have gained a wonderful, wonderful, magnificent sister. Um, knowing you and meeting you and having the time with you. And I thank the most high. And um you are awesome. You are absolutely amazing. The water says, "Praise the Most High! Mm -hmm. Praise the Most High!" <laughs> I love, I love what what I'm. I love this, and it's just bringing all of us so much closer. Mm. And I'm so excited about this um. and where we're going. 
I also want to give a huge thank you to Miss Harriet A. Washington. Our Absolutely. Sister, our Absolutely. sister <laughs> for the incredible work that Absolutely. she did in bringing this information to light in her book. Absolutely. And I look forward to seeing many more of her books Come. And, and what she's, you know, unveiling. Mm -hmm. Once again, if you haven't already read the book, please do so. Medical Apartheid, The Dark History of Medical Experimentation on Black Americans from Colonial Times to the Present. Please get that book. You got sister, you got sister Dee Dee. Uh, she said, normally I would say <clears throat> mother wins, but daughter did submit first. Look at them. <laughs> <laughs> so cute. <laughs> Mm -hmm. The water to both the of you. Water. <laughs> the water. The water. I appreciate <laughs> you. So I am your hostess, Akwat Kuala Yakaka, Voice of Reason and Justice. It has been my absolute pleasure and honor to have this broadcast tonight and to spend time with you have tea with you, you have tea with me. And I am just looking forward to next week's um, Tea Time with Sheba Royalty. Use this week to invite friends, invite family members, invite people that, just invite sisters to come on here and join us. And once again, if you have a, a home-based business, if you have, um, you know, services that you provide, products that you sell, or just products that you want to start putting out there that will help our nation, please reach out to me. Please reach out to me. If you have a specific topic that you are experienced in and, and or an expert in, and you would like to present that and be a co-host or a guest, please do reach out to me. Email me at shebrewroyaltybiz at gmail.com. I really would like to get you on here. Once again, this is a new um, channel. We're trying to increase our um, presence here and to get the word out to sisters in the Hebrew Israelite community about what we're doing. And, you know, so we can get on one accord because we are preparing for the kingdom. That's what this is about. At the end of the day, it's kingdom preparation. So that being said, the most high willing, we'll see each other again next week. In the meantime, may the most high bless us and keep us. May he cause his face to shine upon us and be gracious unto us. May he lift up his countenance upon us and give us peace throughout this entire week. And if it be his will, we will see each other again next week. The Wada, I love you. And don't forget to like, share, subscribe, hit the notification bell. And see you next week. Love you all. Shalom. Shalom. Yam. Have a great night. You enjoy a habata akwas. Habatha. <laughs> Talk to you soon. Shalom.